Pete Carney, how you doing? Doing great. Glad to be All back. All right. Yes, welcome back, Dr. Pete Carney. So this is Steve Weinberger, CEO of the Clearwater Jazz Holiday Foundation. This is our Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. We're here with our good friend, Dr. Pete Carney of the State College of Florida in Bradenton. And we are recording these sessions for the purposes of Clearwater Jazz Holiday Education and Outreach. Today's topic is a part three of a series Pete's been doing called Safer at Home, Simple Methods for Practicing. If you have a specific question, please feel free to use the chat feature or the raise your hand feature and we'll get those questions to Pete. And if you have any suggestions for these virtual sessions that we are doing or feedback, please don't hesitate to email that to info at clearwaterjazz.com. Check out all of these upcoming sessions at clearwaterjazz.com's education and outreach page. And they have all the Zoom information to join the sessions and the upcoming dates. We also have some really neat new resources. The studio archives all past video recordings and the Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions podcast has all of these recordings in audio form and they are brought to you, the video studio is brought to you by Blue Water Wealth Management at Steward Partners and our friends at Marine Max Clearwater are helping to present the podcast series. Dr. Carney is the Director of Jazz Studies at State College of Florida in Bradenton. Recently, his big band students took eight out of 20 chairs in the all-state band for state co colleges in Florida. In the last two years, two of his students have won first place in the statewide FCSSA Jazz Improvisation Scholarship Competition. He has previously given lectures on Radiohead and Jazz at the National Jazz Conference and given a TED Talk on Designing Curiosity in Music Education. Pete's music textbook, Interactive Listening, was chosen by Apple as the editor, editor's choice. He has headlined as a saxophonist at jazz festivals, including the Rochester Jazz Festival and Aberdeen Festival in Scotland with his acid jazz group, Orange Alert, Alert. And locally, he often hosts the jazz session at Ruby's in St. Petersburg. Dr. Pete Carney, welcome back to Clearwater Jazz Holidays, Young Lions Jazz Master Virtual Sessions. The stage is all yours, my friend. Thank you. Thanks, Steve and Lee and Gary. Thanks for having me back. It's great to be, great to be here. And uh, it's great to see how the website's developing. I was looking at it uh, yesterday and uh, the, what is it, the studio it looks great. I mean, it took a big step up. So for all you guys out there, that are playing jazz, be sure to stop over there and check it out. I mean, it's a fantastic resource of people in the area that play music really, really, really well at the, at the top of their game. And you kind of get access to that for free. Um, so I would definitely encourage everybody to check it out. So this is the third part of my um, sort of workout series on what I would do and what I do on, on a normal basis when I practice. What do I practice? At home, like I said before, a majority of our life as musicians is solitary confinement, right? So this this time in our life is reflective of the way it is in uh in the in the normal life. Anyways, you have to sort of fall in love with research, research on your instrument, looking for stuff that you've been told to check out, but also looking for things that are either unique to you. And that, that's the beauty of jazz is you have to play the tradition of people before you, but you also have to add to the conversation. You have to be familiar with it. Everybody's done, but you have to have your own reason to be heard, right? Every musician comes with their own unique personality and it's your job to respect all the musicians that have gone before you and then say, how do I live my life and be a musician through that? Okay, um, that's sort of my philosophy on uh, jazz that I always I try and get in touch with when I when I practice. And at the end of the day, when I practice jazz, jazz is scales and arpeggios, folks. Okay, most of the time you're just playing a scale. Or you're playing an arpeggio. The beauty of 
of jazz is that we do those two things, either a scale or an arpeggio, in very complex ways and combinations, mixtures of scales or adding extra notes. But basically, it's a, when you're soloing, when you're improvising, it's a vertical, you know, I think it was like a vertical staircase and you're going up and down the horn and you can go up in steps or you can go up in leaps. But if just like you're, just like you're running or, or walking, um, jazz to me is like parkour, okay? You can jump, you can leap, but if you jump, usually you'll take a step back. Right, so it's kind of leap up and then step back. What I don't usually do that much of in jazz is leap, 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 right? You don't do that in parkour either. It's like our, our music, our, the lines of our music is very symbolic of how we move through the world as people. Like we walk in steps, uh, Mr. PC. <laughs> He's moving in steps, right? Right? Um, or we, we can, again, you can walk down, you can, that's sort of like walking down the street. We can also think of it uh, like you can skip or hop. Right? But it's all, it's all just sort of this idea of motion and a vertical line. Right. So anything you do has like a if you, you can't do things that you couldn't do in the real world. That's my point here. Like I, I, I can't I can't leap higher than my um, my own height. Right. I can't even leap that high. But everything you do in music is related to like our physical space because we like music to sort of sound like reality to sound like people. OK, so like so these ideas are pretty rare if I leap really high. It doesn't sound too musical and I think part of that is because the architecture is so far away the notes are so far from each other that they don't sound musical together because they don't sound realistic like a real person a real person can walk a real person can run a real person can jump <laughs> Right, so it's a mixture of those, of that symmetry of the way we move through the world. I just think that's important to always think about, like, what am I practicing? Am I making music that sounds real? Um, okay, so we left off last time with that uh, like, like sort of philosophical thing. Um, we left off with triads, and I, I recommended you guys practice triads because in jazz you have to know the triads in order to play anything. <laughs> right it's real important um, because the triad is everything in western music the next step of that that i wanted to get into today more is taking triads and using them in pairs so i could take a g major triad and an f major triad two triads a whole step apart <laughs> Right, really cool sound because you have the strength of a triad and you have two different triads that are alternating. I'm playing G, F, G, F, G, F. And because I know my triads well enough, I can play, I can move up through those triads in interesting ways. <laughs> Right? It was only two separate groups of notes. They were alternating back and forth, and that alternation kind of creates some tension and some beauty. Um, but the logic of those triads being the same triad a whole step apart from each other makes them uh, work together very well. So like, well, what does that have to do with music? It's, it's a neat idea by itself. I wanted to kind of play you an example of why you should practice your triad pairs. Um, why you should practice that over a dominant chord. Like I said before, you have to start with your triads. You have to, uh, but the, what we're going to do from, from, uh, from going forward here today is we're going to take our triads and then put them over dominant chords. All right, that's a beautiful sound. So here's um, two triads, that are the same thing I just played. 
I'm just gonna, I've got this play along track pulled up here. For, if, for those of you that wanna find it, this is one of my all time favorite practice tools. If you just go on YouTube and type in dominant cord workout, dominant cord workout, just a great way to shed, a great way to practice. Um, it goes through all 12 dominant cords. Um, and it gives you time to stretch out on each one. Like you can like really forget about working on tunes. If you can't get through this dominant workout, you should do this first. It's a good like sort of uh, like oil change in your plane, you know, every 50,000 miles. Every time I'm rusty, I come back to this every time I'm rusty because it, it tunes up my brain. It makes me think through all 12 keys and it gives me a simple goal to, um, to just hone in on the dominant chord. So I'm gonna play these two triad pairs that I talked about. In this case, uh, I think this one starts on C. Let me see here. Yeah, it starts on C major. So I'm gonna play my C major triad and my B flat triad. I'm just gonna alternate. I'll play all three notes from the first triad and then I'll switch over and play all three notes from the B flat triad. And I'm not going to play too fast. I want you to just kind of listen to what it sounds like. You don't want to practice this stuff too quickly um, because you're not learning anything. You're, gonna, you're just going to create sort of bad habits. You have to always learn super slow. You know, don't ever be fooled into thinking like playing fast uh, comes from playing fast. Playing fast comes from playing slow. <laughs> it sounds silly, but... Um, it's like, it's like dancing, you know, you, you have to, you can't learn a dance step. Um, if you're, if you're trying to do it at tempo, right? So anyways, here's, let's, let's check out these two triads, C, uh, my C triad and my B flat triad. And I'm just going to jam with those a little bit. right it's a cool little sound uh, it's kind of modern it's kind of broken the neat thing about um, practicing a technique or a specific etude like this is that i always find that i run into people from history i could run into uh john coltrane or louis armstrong and i can hear those duke ellington I could definitely hear Duke Ellington if I did this. Right? He thought he 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 thought in a very logical way. So whenever you're practicing something logical, you run into famous people that have been there before you. That's the cool part about jazz. It's like, oh, that was Sonny Rollins. He he's been here before me in a very like uh, kind of spine tingling way you re-encounter history in I, you, you understand why people played something because he was thinking about this triad concept it's just one triad it's just one concept right but it's been used by Coltrane to Ellington to you know everybody in between um, and still today it's still very common um, it's a powerful tool that gives you a neat sound so I wanted to let's do it one more time C triad and B flat. Right, it sounds like Coltrane if I could play it kind of fast and, and pushy. And what if I add another triad to it? What if I, I played C, B flat? What if I add an A flat triad to it? right so because because the, I'm, i have a rule here of adding a, a game of addition i had started with D, a c b flat and then a flat even though that's outside of the key it works because the rule of what i started with is consistent that takes me outside of the key Okay, so 
the, the rules are the freedom that you create in your own performance, right? The more you learn to play the rules, the more freedom you get because the, the rules will take you to outside stuff. A lot of young cats want to play all the like, advanced, crazy outside stuff nobody's played yet. The people found those outside crazy things by playing the rules to their limitation and then kind of breaking, jumping over the fence with that. Listen to how the first triad sounds, the first two sound really inside, and then the next two triads I play sound more dissonant, but still pretty because it has a certain dark tension to it. Right? So it's a very limited etude. In a sense, you're just trying to play the three notes of each triad, and then you're trying to flip it over, and uh, you're trying to explore every permutation of those three choices, right? That's uh, a fun thing to do, and, and it's, it, it, it gets you engaged um, both creatively, because you, have to, you get to make your own decisions, but it's also rigorous, and it makes you accountable to what you're practicing. You, you know that you're practicing something for a reason, right? I always tell people, don't play or don't practice if you don't know what you're practicing for. Don't practice just to make, you know, like if you don't know what you're working on, you might not be, um, it might not be the best use of your time. You have to like learn stuff when you practice, not just sort of jam. Like we do when we perform, we let all that go, right? When you walk on stage, you're trying not to practice on stage. Um, that's where you do let go, but your routine, your the rigorousness of your practice um, method is what make, gives you the freedom later on. Um, and then you, I think as you get older too, you start to, you don't think about freedom as much as you did. I don't think about it as much as I did when I was younger um, because you know that the sort of relationship between hard work and freedom is very <laughs> mysterious. Like they're, they're like, it's like freedom, hard work. Okay. If you like that, like you, like you don't get freedom without working hard. Um, right. And if you don't like working hard, you'll never get to the freedom. So the, like, they're very, like, they never let each other go. So uh, in your practicing, keep that in mind. I think, like you have to like practicing because jazz is practicing, but it's also discipline. It's also, it's freedom and it's discipline, but those two never let go of each other. Um, I used to think that I was practicing to get freedom, but the, but the routine is the freedom. And that's something like Kobe Bryant said, the, he said, uh, the practice is the dream, you know? Okay, so that's the, the two, using a couple triads. Take any two major triads and try them out. They sound, the ones I like the most are a whole step apart from each other. A lot of people like half step apart, love that too. Um, but any two major triads have a great powerful sound um, and you can superimpose it on stuff. If I was playing, if I was playing like a, uh, let's see, like an F7 sus chord, what sounds great? These two, uh, my F chord and my E flat chord triad are in this chord, so that's a beautiful sound to try out. Right, a lot of beautiful music starts from, from very simple, um, conceptions. Okay, uh, so after my major chord, a lot of times what I'll turn to is working on my dominant chord. That means I'm going to add the seventh of the chord, the lowered seventh, and I'm just going to improvise with those four notes. This is one of the routines I do the most in my life. Um, somebody showed me this at uh, University of Miami when I was younger, and I realized I couldn't do it. And I was like, I wasn't young. I was probably 
23 or 24. Um, and I, and I realized, man, I've got a big hole in my plane. I couldn't just play the four, like improvise with four notes. I had to have like other stuff. And I was maybe sort of forgetting some of, I, I hadn't spent enough time on like the foundation of, um, getting through all the 12 keys easily. Same workout on YouTube, go to the dominant chord workout, um, and just play the four chord tones of each chord. You can, you know, print a sheet and look at it if you want, but it's just as good for you to do this by ear. Um, that's part of like the jazz language and, and jazz tradition. It's great for you to do with a friend and take turns going back and forth. That's a phenomenal way to practice. You will get better if you practice with other people more than just jamming by yourself. Don't, don't wait to, um, uh, don't wait to play for people when you're done learning because you have to get out there on the dance floor and make some mistakes. And we, I feel like we really get rhythm from each other. We get better at rhythm together. Um, so find people to practice with, um, even if they're not as good as you. Don't just look to practice with people that are ready. Find people, anybody that will play with you is a good musician to play with. All right. Um, so again, I talked about just playing the dominant chord, just practicing over the dominant chord and just the four chord tones of each chord. These, this, these chords are going to change every, uh, I think four bars. And I'm going to limit myself to one, three, five, and seven. I'm not going to play any other notes than that. Let's check that out. I started to realize the creativity is down inside of etudes like this. This is where you find out if you can be creative or not. Rhythmically, like line-wise, can you still play good music when you're only allowed to play four chord tones at a time? Four notes is really limited and very tough. It forces you to be very angular, okay, because the notes aren't close to each other. They're separated by space. So if you're, like, if some people practice scales too much, some people maybe play arpeggios too much, but most of the time people spend, I feel like people spend too much time on scales and not enough time on arpeggios, Okay, and this is an arpeggio exercise, it forces you to just play the four primary colors of this scale. You can, of course, add the other notes, but the beautiful question of, of jazz is what can you do with the information you have? Can you, can you make great music out of four choices rather than eight choices? Um, if it reveals your creativity, it reveals your creativity because if you, if, if it's like, if it's a weakness, it will show itself that you're not good at this limitation if you have to go back to scales in a sense. All right, so try that out. Definitely practice your, and if you can, you can do this with a play along, I feel like it helps you develop a sense of rhythmic improvisation, developing lines with rhythm. It helps you sort of play with angular space. Um, it makes you breathe in strange places. It makes you just kind of, the, the, the awkwardness of it is kind of beautiful if you let it sit there so you get more you get more comfortable with abstract ideas right <laughs> right that's pretty abstract um, 
and so you have to you, you abstract comes from the, the the space between the notes right so you have to get used to that being around you and playing through it um and you actually forces me to listen to myself more too if i'm if i can only play these four notes what am i doing with it um what are my tendencies am i rushing am i dragging do I stay in one part of the horn too much? Um, am I, do I have a good sound that people want to hear? You know, um, that goes back to the, the previous episode we did on just listening to sound. And now this to me is always like, after I've warmed up in those first episodes we did, this is now when I'm still listening to myself and saying, is this music still there when I add, make, add another complicated layer, okay? The next step to this is, is a beautiful one. You'll hear Coltrane use this a lot or Michael Brecker. Um, take the dominant chord and just add the ninth to it so that you get the ninth is the same as the two of the scale. So you get one, two, three, five, seven. So you get a five note group. Listen to some of that. <laughs> right so and i've been here before on this exercise and then i had to confront the fact uh, I've played this before, but the last thing I hadn't played before. Uh, I, ha I haven't played that before. And the only reason I found it today is because I've been here before and I'm tired of the stuff I played before. Okay. So because I'm in this etude and I'm locked in with a technique, that technique like had a brief moment of freedom where I played something I hadn't played. Does that make sense? That's again, going back to how the, the technique that you build will grind out. It's like mows the yard, right? Your, your routine of your life and practicing is like mowing the yard. And then finally something new comes up when you, but it's, it's a lot of times you're just playing through stuff you've played before and hopefully you you don't get you don't uh live with that limitation you let the repetition of your practicing help dig up new stuff along the way so that one two three five seven that's one of my favorite ways to check my physical playing out my sound out and um and and like my creativity I, you have to like warm up your creative creativity also you, a lot of times when you sort of get to practicing the first couple minutes or 15 minutes, it's like the whole world is distracting you. And so these sort of rigorous etudes, they force you to stay inside of something that pulls you out of the distraction and it makes you focus. And then you start to sort of like see the other world of music and you focus on it. And the etude creates that like creative moment you're looking for to find something new. Um, again, one, two, three, five, seven. I love this one. I'm just going to keep going here. stretch out a little bit farther on the horn. The etude is pushing me into different parts of the horn that I might not practice in. 
the limitation of what of the game I'm playing is for is is helping me climb out of my habits and I, I, I reach in for that high A flat. I wouldn't usually go to that, but the 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 method took me there. So it made me like because I only had to think about the five notes that I was playing, I could I could see the higher part of the horn in my head. Okay. I if I was just thinking about uh, in that case, it was over B flat seven, which is a nasty chord on the saxophone. Uh, concert A flat seven, it's a nasty horn on the saxophone. Uh, for it just always gives me fits. So if I see that B flat seven chord symbol come up, I'm thinking about that whole scale, right? But this etude tells me to just think about the five notes. That is a liberating moment because I can choose to play higher or lower. I'm not instead of thinking about seven notes, I'm thinking about seven or eight, I'm thinking about five. But even though those notes go up in, in higher ranges, that makes sense. I'm sure anybody that's made it this far in the video knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> if that doesn't make sense, this isn't the right video for you. <laughs> all right. Um, so that, again, I think all these arpeggio exercises are more important than scales in a sense, because they, it gets you to really build a language on the fun fundamentals of the chord. The scale is part of the, of the chord, but it's not as important. The rest of the notes are not as important as, as the fundamentals. And nowadays they're actually calling it chord scale. It's not, we, in jazz, we don't call it a chord or a scale as often the sort of newer terminology calls it chord scale because it's a chord and it's a scale at the same time. It's just how you, how you play it out whether it's vertical or, or simultaneous or horizontal. Um, the next step of that is, and again, I think you should, that's all this stuff is fundamental to being a good jazz musician. Like I said before, scale, jazz is just chords and arpeggios. Don't let anybody tell you differently. You do have to know a lot of stuff, but you can only play one note on, at a time on, on most instruments, right? Especially when you're soloing. Um, you can obviously play more notes on piano and guitar, but we solo as, as like a one note language most of the time. So you have to think like that. And it's, just, it's either you, you either playing arpeggio or a chord, moving in steps or leaping. Okay. The next step is um, what people are more familiar with is like this dominant bebop scale. This is a great workout um, where you take your, uh, you can think of it two ways. You can take your major scale and add the flat seven to the scale. Or you can think of it as your dominant scale, adding the major seventh. I like to think of it as both sevens are in the scale. So it's, it's the first chord is C, uh, C, D, E, F, G, A, B flat, B, C. So it's got both sevens. Take a second to kick off here. That's the scale. Right? That seventh gives you an extra step by having, uh, in my case, the B flat and the B added to the scale. It makes it an eight note scale. That's all you really want to think about. It's, it's basically an eight note scale. It makes it means that if you're playing beats that are four beats in the bar, one, two, three, four, um, your eighth notes, your lines are going to have eight clicks so that they make sense. The seven note scale is a little harder to improvise with. We add that extra half step. Charlie Parker was really one of the masters of this. Um, before him, Westmont, I mean, it's not, uh, Charlie Christian did it. Um, and but he, Charlie Parker is really the one that kind of maximized this to me in a lot of ways. He, he took the dominant chord and he consistently added that, uh, had both sevens in the scale or added the major seven to the dominant chord. However you want to think of it, it's the same thing. It's just an extra eighth note. You can add that half step anywhere in the scale, to be honest, and it still sounds pretty cool. You don't, it doesn't have to be the seventh. Check this out. I'm going to, um, and Bird would do this a lot. He would put the extra, he needed an extra half step to make his seven note scale have eight counts. And he would just throw 
that half step wherever he wanted. Um, right? So I put the half step in a different place, add an extra, an extra different half step in that major scale. And as long as you've got that extra note, you get this eight count scale instead of a seven count. And it gives you a very fluid sound. It's, it's like, it's very, like, it's seamless and it skates really well. Right? It's kind of hard. It's kind of hard on the fingers. It's kind of wobbly. Um, you can get ahead of yourself or you can be swinging too hard with it. So what I tell people a lot is to just practice it. Don't, uh, don't work on improvising all the time with it. Spend some time just playing it over, over your track. Just play it. Just the only improv is really where you change directions, but pick a chord tone. Um, this is C7. Pick a chord tone. I'm going to pick a chord tone and I'm just going to play that scale up and down. And I'm just, I'm just gonna, I'm not really improvising, right? I'm building my technique. right you don't need to spend all of your time trying to improvise but you you, you do need to practice things or practice concepts and right here i'm just practicing my con conception of, of of the scale building sounding convincing and and sounding um consistent in in its nature like i don't sound bad on some parts of the horn and i don't rush when I'm crossing over the saxophone in certain parts, can I be very effortless with it? Great etude. Uh, right? You can hear Bird. Uh, you can hear him. You could hear what he was practicing when you hear those phrases after you've done it enough. Like I could hear that Bird was probably doing something very similar to that. Not just practicing improv, really just practicing music, practicing the physical part of playing the horn and playing those scales all the way through the range of your ability. So that's a great one. That one's the one people are coming with. Um, the other way you can think of those is the, as a major scale, as a, as a major bebop scale. If I was improvising, thinking the same play along concept and practicing over major, uh, a major chord workout, I would add an extra third to the scale. So G major, scale uh, I would add the B flat to the scale and do that same thing sorry that, that's for minor my bad with the major you add the extra six again these are just these aren't rules they're suggestions so it's your major scale G A B C D E and I add the E flat between the E and the E and then F sharp and G on the top. So. Right. Right. So that's, um, that's just an expression of that scale. And if you look, you have to look at people's solos, go on YouTube and type in a, uh, Charlie Parker transcription and a lot of people have put his solos up there and written the chords and look at what I'm talking about and you'll see it all over the place. You'll see it all throughout Charlie Parker and Miles Davis. You'll see it in Coltrane and you'll see it in everybody from Santana to whoever you listen to that has gone through jazz learning will use these, the, these bebop scale techniques. Um, the other thing that's pretty cool is like, let's go back to our dominant chord bebop scale. 
is to work on that as um, Jerry Bergonzi, this famous teacher in Boston at Berkeley, he, um, he, he liked to think of the dominant scale as a 10 note bebop scale. So he plays chromatically from the root to the third of the chord, and then the rest of it is a dominant bebop scale. Okay, let's say that again. You play all the notes from, like if I'm in C7, I play all the notes from C to E, and then I play the bebop scale the rest of the way up. It's a cool sound because it creates um, um, some pretty strong dissonance that you can push around. It makes it tougher. It makes it more complicated. Uh, it makes un some unusual note combinations it's kind of jump out at you. I love the sound of it because it's, it's, it has that bebop sound, but it's also just very like, has a little bit of meanness to it. Check it out. more like and that's just like so, oh young guys are gonna go that's what i want to sound like it's gutsier and it's more more tough guy type music the 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 danger is you have to play the other stuff first to, to like absorb this one you can't skip to this one it's only what i practice again i don't i don't practice this one nearly as much as i practice the dominant chords and the triads and the long tones all that stuff because this is like, yes, it's, it's neat, but it's only going to help you if you can do the other ones. Otherwise, it can actually like, kind of mess you up, I think. Let's listen to a little more of that. Again, 10-note bebop scale. <laughs> switched over to our next choice here which is diminished scale um you might have heard about this most younger guys have kind of run into this somewhere in high school and this is a half step whole step scale all the way up so you take a half step whole step half step whole step half step whole step from whatever the root of the chord is there's only three diminished scales to memorize so you can check you can find those on the internet it'll take two seconds um, and you have to memorize them and then play them on all 12 keys because there's only three different ones because they repeat as you go up three half steps. They, they're the same again. So that's the cool thing about diminished scale. Um, Coltrane, again, Coltrane uses this a lot. And everybody, Johnny Griffin, Cannonball Adderley, Bill Evans, or whoever, everybody played the diminished scale. Dexter Gordon used it a ton. And some of his cadenzas is really beautiful. Uh, diminished scale is great in those sort of big dissonant moments. Um, so I'll play a little of that. This is over F, uh, E flat seven. So the scale would be E flat, E, F sharp, G, A, B flat, C, D flat, E flat. <laughs> You can hear old movies in this. You can hear old movie sounds. Check it out. Right? You hear these old movie references? Well, they're old in in, in <laughs> today they're old, but they were part of especially the sort of founding years of jazz. That's why you hear everybody was hip to it. They were stealing from Hollywood or from Broadway or whatever, stealing, stealing everything they heard, they would borrow it if it was cool, you know? So 
the the diminished scale is beautiful and like I, I played in an older style and it sounded like older music all of a sudden but if i play it in a modern style it doesn't sound necessarily like an old movie i guess right so the language in some ways stays the same um but how you play the language has changed. The accent of our jazz music is different than the accent was a hundred years ago. Um, and that leads us to the last thing I want to talk about today, which is uh, if I was to make this uh, dominant chord, what we call altered, or I would use a what's called a melodic minor scale. That's a great sound. Um, so I'm going to place, only explain, I'll get back my track up here. Uh, I'm gonna, we're going back to C7. And this is one of the hardest choices, um, but a great, um, it's, it's, it's really like, it's been, I've worked on this for years and years and years and years, and it's um, very hard to do, but it's, it's a beautiful modern sound. And it's, it's called, the, we call it the altered chord. So the C7, uh, the, the scale is altered so that, instead of, I don't want to get too deep into the theory of it, really. It has what we call a sharp nine and a flat nine on it. It can have a flat 13, and it still has the dominant sound. Like, this is with my C7 chord before. Now, C7 altered sounds like this. More intense flavor. Not just used by jazz, Jimi Hendrix and um, Purple Haze. Not, not like this, but he does a voicing that he, he used uh, this one, I think. Wait. Anyways, he, Hen Hendrix uses it also. It's not unique to jazz or anything, but it's definitely something we really explore a lot, the altered chord. So it's the root, flat nine, flat, um, sharp nine, third, sharp 11, flat 13, seven and then the root again great sound check it out on piano a little bit bill evans herbie hancock I'm not saying that I sound like Herbie Hancock. <laughs> I'm just saying that you can hear people that uh, these people have definitely explored it to a high degree. A beautiful color. One of the hardest ones to, to do in jazz is to play the, the melodic minor. So if it's C7 altered, uh, then I'm going to be playing C sharp minor major seven over the top of it. C sharp minor seven scale, minor major seven scale over the top of it. Right. Um, it's it 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 puts you in a difficult posi position uh, as an improviser because if you miss, it sounds bad. So it's a very high risk scale. If you play a note that's not in that scale. Uh, or if you're trying to play that scale and you play something that's outside of it, it can be pretty ugly. Uh, <laughs> Great sound. Right, very colorful. It's very tense and it's very dark on its own. 
um, but it can be very beautiful. Like you, if you think about music, it's a balance between brightness and darkness. And so this is the dark world of the dark side of the force. And it, it balances itself out with the brighter major chords or, the, or even minor is brighter than, than um, the dominant altered. So listen to that sound over the top of a regular C7. Oh, sorry. I didn't, tra I didn't tra transpose it right. Hold on. <laughs> Okay, so if you've been listening for a while, like, it's like okay, I start to hear a lot of him playing. It's, it, all, it all sounds the same because as me as an improviser, I'm blending the, the my, my sound starts to sound like if I was a regular person listening to this, I would say, okay, I hear a lot of Pete Carney playing after this 30 minute thing, talk, right? But the beauty of, of putting all these together is, is how do you, how do you break out of um, uh, the rut of, of creativity? I would take, let's take all of these things that we mentioned, and then I'll play a couple bars of each of them. So that way my personality is changing. I'll start with the triads we played at the beginning, right? Then I'll switch to the dominant pentatonic. Then I'll switch to the dominant bebop. And then I'll switch to this dominant altered sound here. Okay, so by switching scales, as I switching choices, the chord's gonna remain the same, right? But I'm gonna change personalities by switching the material. Okay, that make, gives me more range as a performer. It's not always like being really good at one thing. In jazz, it's like how many different things can you juggle? How many complex ways of playing can you do at the same time? So I'll start with triads and I'll switch to dominant pentatonic, dominant bebop, and then dominant altered at the end. And you'll hear that it gets, it goes from generally speaking, it'll go from brightness to more intense darkness towards the end, like a good solo would usually. That's all the little techniques we went through today put together in one sort of bigger chain of a solo. And my, I was also sort of changing my sound to be more intense, to sort of follow that story of, like, of intensity becoming uh, bigger at, towards the end and like developing into something. You're, again, that's why we practice these techniques so isolated because it's like a different um, brush stroke, you know, or 
a different move on the dance floor. You can't go out on the dance floor and learn them all, <laughs> learn them all at once. You have to practice them all independently and then put it all together. Okay, so I hope that helps. That's a lot of stuff to practice, and that's mostly what I practice most of the time that I'm practicing. Thanks a lot. Man, that was so great, Pete. Thank you so much for this. Uh, we really appreciate you have having you continuing to be involved with these sessions. Of course. Uh, we, uh, you and I were talking uh, before the session about some other creative topics that I'm excited about. And so um, hopefully we'll be able to get you back. I know that we have at least one more on the books right now with you on August 10th, which That's is right. improvising over Stella by Starlight, negotiating different chord changes, which I think um, will be really great to yeah. include um yeah, that's uh, a great college uh college audition tune for anybody that's out there practicing for auditions or i mean it's a real important tune like it's it's a judgment tune i hope to give you guys some ideas of what professors want to hear when you play it when you when you get in go to jazz school what they want to hear you can uh, you can play stella and if you can do that then maybe you'll get some money <laughs> for school <laughs> Nice. So um, check out uh, for those that are that are uh, listening to the pot to the to the podcast or watching this in the studio later. Please check out uh, all the upcoming sessions. Some really really great musicians and educators are involved. Again, you can access all of that by going to the Clearwater Jazz Holidays Education and Outreach page and um, see all those upcoming sessions. We thank our sponsors for helping to expand the reach of these sessions, including the one that you are watching or listening to today uh, by the Al Downing Tampa Bay Jazz Association who believe in what we're doing and helping to do more. So thank you Al Downing for everything you guys are doing. And Pete, it's always a pleasure, man. We look forward to seeing you soon. Good to see you Lee. Thanks a lot for having me guys. All right. Stay uh, safe, everyone. Be well and keep playing. We'll see you soon. Thanks, Steve.